This lecture is part of a series of lectures on elliptic functions and in today's lecture I'm going to be talking about the functions um, studied by Jacobi which are usually denoted by Sn, Cn and Dn. Um, these functions are kind of a bit out of fashion. I mean books on elliptic functions in the 19th century were all about Jacobi's functions whereas um, they, they seem to be almost unused in pure math these days. I mean, Lang wrote a quite large book on elliptic functions um, last century and doesn't even mention the Jacobi functions. Um, so um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about Jacobi functions. Instead, I'm going to use them mainly as an excuse to discuss line bundles over an elliptic curve. Um, so I'll just quickly recall um, um, basics of elliptic functions. We have a lattice L in the complex numbers and our elliptic function is periodic in L. So f of z plus lambda is equal to f of z whenever lambda is in L. And as we saw in previous lectures, um, f must have some poles um, and the sum of the residues of the poles of f, um, that's in a fundamental domain of course, must be um, equal to zero. As you can see, you remember we just integrate f dz around the, around the boundary of a fundamental domain and this is zero because it cancels by periodicity. So if we want to find the simplest sort of functions, um, we might try having one pole, um, but one pole doesn't work because if we had just one pole of order one, then the residue would have to be zero, so it wouldn't exist. So there are two possibilities. We can either have one pole of order two and residue zero, or we can have two poles of order one, where one has residue minus the other. And um, roughly speaking, this is the approach taken by Weierstrass, which we discussed in the previous lecture, and this is the approach taken by Jacobi, which we're going to discuss today. Um, and Weierstrass's approach is easier for the following reason. Um, suppose we've got one pole in a fundamental domain, where do we put it? Well, um, it's pretty obvious where to put it. The pole is going to be at the point z equals zero, or more generally for z in any lattice. I mean, any other choice would just be stupid. But if we've got two poles, uh, where are we going to put them? Well, first of all, there's a constraint because um, the sum of the poles, um, if there are poles at z1 and z2, then z1 plus z2 must be in the lattice, as you remember from lecture two. So um, inside a fundamental domain, here we've got a fundamental domain, we've got to find, um, we've got to choose two different points um, whose sum is in the lattice. And if you think about it, there's no really good canonical way of doing this. Um, z1 or z2 can't be zero because then the other would have to be zero and we'd have a double pole at zero. And similarly, you, you see that the other obvious choice would be these half lattice points. And these don't work either because again, z1 would have to be equal to z2. So we've got to somehow choose two points that sum up to zero inside this fundamental domain. Now, as you can see, there are lots of ways of doing this and there doesn't seem to be any way that's picked out for being rather special. And <clears throat> This is one of the main reasons why Jacobi's approach to elliptic functions is a bit of a mess compared to Weierstrass's approach, because you've kind of got to break the symmetry of your problem by choosing a pole somewhere. What, what Jacobi did, in fact, was he chose two points of order four like that. But there are lots of other ways of doing that. I mean, you, you could choose these two points here, or you could choose um, these two points here and so on. So, um, you know, you've got to break symmetry. And this breaking of symmetry means that everything gets more complicated because you've got to write out everything several times um, instead of just once because you've lost the symmetry. Um, 
Well, th th there's actually a way of dealing with the Jacobi functions that doesn't avoid breaking the symmetry, or at least not quite so much. Um, so there's a solution. We can have just one pole of order one in a fundamental domain. Um, well, I just said you can't have just one pole of order one if you've got a, a periodic function. So you have to chain, um, modify the periodicity slightly. So the function is going to be not quite periodic. And for an example of this, let's look at the function sine of z. So sine of z plus 2 pi is equal to sine of z. So so it's, it's, it's got a period, um, 2 pi. Um, but instead, we could say sine of z plus pi is equal to minus sine of z. Um, so um, what it... What we have is, is we have here a fudge factor. And the function has period pi, except um, it's not quite a period. It's periodic up to this fudge factor. Um, and we can do the same for doubly periodic functions. Um, um, so what we want is f of z plus lambda is going to be fc times c lambda, where c lambda is going to be some element of the complex numbers. And now we want f of z plus lambda plus mu should be equal to f of z of mu plus lambda, rather obviously, which gives you c lambda times c mu um, is equal to, um, I, I guess this should also be f of lambda z plus lambda plus mu. So this gives us c lambda c mu equals c mu c lambda equals c um, lambda plus mu. So c lambda is actually a homomorphism from the lattice L to the non-zero complex numbers. Um, and we're going to look at the case when c lambda is equal to plus or minus 1. So this is the simplest case. And obviously c is determined by its values on omega 1 and omega 2. So um, there are four possibilities. Um, we could have c omega 1 and c omega 2. It could be plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, minus 1. Now, this case is where the, the, the functions are periodic. And we've already covered that. Um, um, but you see that there are now three more cases, and these are going to correspond to the three Jacobi functions, um, Sn, Cn, and Dn. Um, and now you notice if a function is not quite periodic in this way, um, then it still has periods, but the periods are going to be slightly bigger than omega 2. So, so here the periods are specified by omega 1 and omega 2 in this case. But here you see omega 2 changes the function by minus 1. So if you have 2 omega 2, then and the function is going to be periodic. And similarly, this is periodic with respect to 2 omega 1 and omega 2. And this is periodic with respect to 2 omega 1 and omega 1 plus omega 2. Um, so um, here, these are the three index two sublattices of L. And one of the annoying things about Jacobi functions is the lattice they're periodic under keeps changing. I mean, so, so Sn is periodic under some lattice and Cn is periodic under some different lattice. And this is, this is very annoying. Um, but if you don't think of them as being periodic functions, but just functions that are periodic up to sign, then the lattice stays the same each time. So this makes it a little bit easier to think about them. Um, you, you can ask, um, why, why 
is c lambda equal to plus or minus 1? And the answer is there's no good reason. Um, we can take c lambda is an nth root of unity for some n, and then we, we get n squared possibilities um, for the different sorts of functions. And this means that instead of getting, you know, when n was 2, we got two squared possibilities, one of which is periodic. So altogether, we would get n squared minus 1 elliptic functions. So Jacobi was doing the case n equals 2 of this, and, and you can do um, other, other values of n, but it just gets a bit messy. I mean, you would have, you know, if n is 3, you would get eight elliptic functions instead of just three. Actually, when I say there's no good reason, that's not quite true. Um, there is actually a reason why n equals 2 is rather better than the other cases, that n equals 2 corresponds to something called the symmetric line bundles, the, the line bundles that are isomorphic to their dual, and that, that does make things a little bit easier. Um, well, let, let's take a quick look at some properties of these not quite periodic functions. So we're going to have f of z plus omega i is equal to c i times f of omega times f of z. Um, so you recall for periodic functions we have the number of poles is equal to the number of zeros. And this still holds um, for this case here. And you can prove it in much the same way. You remember we can count the number of poles minus the number of zeros by doing this funny integral here, as in complex analysis. And we take the integral around the boundary of a fundamental domain like that. And the bits on the top and the bottom cancel out, and the bits on the left and the right cancel out, so that's zero. Um, slightly more interesting case was um, for periodic functions, we had the um, sum of the zeros minus the sum of the poles. And uh, for periodic functions, you remember this was in the lattice L. Um, and the way we got it was by looking at the integral 1 over 2 pi i times the integral of z, f prime of z over fc dz. Um, well, the problem is, um, if the function is not quite periodic, the, the, the left and the right intervals no longer quite cancel out. Um, so and what we get is something like omega 2 times the um, integral from 0 to omega 1 of f prime of z over fc dz minus omega 1 times some integral. And this is the logarithm of f of z, and it might, might change by um, log of c1. And if c1 is an nth root of unity, this might be some um, integer of the form m over n times 2 pi i. So here we're taking c1 to the n equals 1. We're taking n equals 2 in our case. Um, and if we work this out, we find that this is actually not in L. It's um, so this is this is not in zero. It's um, some element of C modulo L. It's not necessarily the zero element. Um, it's in um, one over n L modulo L if um, c i to the n is equal to 1 for, for um, at some integer n, which is the, 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 the most useful case. So instead of the sum of the zeros minus the sum of the poles being 0 modulo L, it's some fixed non-zero element of this lattice depending on the, 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 these quasi-periodic case. So let, let's look at the case of the, the Jacobi functions. In this case, c i is equal to plus or minus 1. So the sum of the poles minus the sum of the zeros is equal is, is something in um, a half L. And you see that, that, that there are four possibilities. 
um, if is a fundamental domain. And there are four elements of C modulo L such that two of that is in L, which are like this. And one of these doesn't count. That's just the periodic case where you can't have a function with one pole. Um, so we can have functions. Um, so these are almost periodic functions with a pole at one of these three points. So these four points. So sorry. Um, so the, the the sum of the pole minus the sum of the zeros is at, is at one of these four points. Um, so we've got a. We, um, can we get a function with just one pole of order one? And the answer is yes, we can. And where are you going to put this pole? Well, it's obvious where you're going to put this pole. If you've got a function with a pole, you put it at the origin. Uh, you wish. Um, in fact, Jacobi decided not to put it at the origin. For complicated historical reasons, he actually put the pole here at omega 2 over 2. And, you know, this is a another way in which Jacobi's elliptic functions have kind of got messed up. But Jacobi put the pole in the wrong place. So the pole of Sn, Cn, Dn is at omega 2 over 2 and not 0 for some weird reason. Um, so, um, so what's going on here is the poles and the zeros look like this. So here's a fundamental domain. Omega 1, omega 2, and 0. And the functions all have a pole at this point here. So that's Sn, Cn, and Dn all have a pole here. And they the, 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 then the sum of the poles minus the sum of the zeros must be in 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 a half L. So there are three possibilities for the zero. And Sn is equal to zero at this point here, and Cn is equal to zero at this point here, and Dn is equal to zero at this point here. Um, um, by the way, I should say the periods are usually called um, 2k and 2k prime instead of omega 1 and omega 2 when people do um, Jacobi functions. As I mentioned earlier, one of the annoying things is um, when you, <laughs> there are several completely different systems of notation. When people do Jacobi functions, they use a different period lattice from people who, who do Weierstrass functions, which is a utter pain when you're trying to compare the two sorts of functions. Um, well, so we want to find functions with a pole of order one here and zeros of order one at one of these three points. So, so let's find existence and relation to the Weierstrass function. So at the moment, I ha we haven't yet actually shown that the, 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 the Jacobi functions exist. Well, existence is quite easy. If I take the Weierstrass function of Z and subtract rho of um, omega 2 over 2, this um, has a 0 of order 2 at omega 2 over 2 and a pole of order 2 at 0. And it's got no other zeros and poles. So because all its zeros and poles have even order, we can take its square root and get a single valued function. So this is now single valued. I mean, usually when you take the square root of something, you get a horrible mess whenever whenever the function vanishes because you get a branch point. But if if all zeros of order two, then taking a square root just gives you a zero of order one. Um, um, and it has a pole of order one at um, zero 
and it's periodic up to sine. So if, if we define this function here, then we see that f of z plus omega 2 is equal to minus f of z, and f of z plus omega 1 is equal to f of z. So we pick up a minus sign because we're sort of taking a square root, which puts in a which puts in minus ones at um, various points. Um, this is almost but not quite one of the Jacobi functions. It's um, you see the Jacobi function has a z Sn has a zero here, and, and this one has a pole at the origin. So in fact, this function is um, sort of linear in one over Sn, um, and you know some constant plus a constant times s and i'm not i'm not going to put the constants in because they that i can never remember them and they um and um the other problem is people use different conventions and different notations so whichever constants i put in someone's going to tell me i'm wrong um so uh so so that constructs the function one over s n so so um so, so you can obviously just take an inverse and get the function Sn, and you can get Cn and Dn by similar formulas. Um, so that shows the existence of the Jacobi functions with the properties I've stated. Um, and then you remember that all elliptic functions for L are given by... Um, um, you, given by either Weierstrass p function or its derivative. Um, let's say the let, let's take functions with the only poles at zero. And all elliptic functions are given by by quotients of these. And there's a similar theorem for Jacobi functions. If you take all elliptic functions for um, two L. They're given by um, um, with poles only at zero. They're given by um, C of ns, Cs, and Ds. And I'd better explain this notation. So ns is equal to one over Sn. Cs is equal to Cn over Dn, where these are Jacobi's functions, and Ds is equal to D, Dn over Sn. So these are the functions, these are three functions with poles um, at, um, whose poles are at, at the origin. Um, there's also a relation between these functions here. You remember there's this differential equation um, satisfied by Weierstrass's function, which is minus 4p um, plus g, so p cubed plus g2 p plus g3. Um, similarly, there are some relations between these three functions. In fact, if you look at ns squared, cs squared, and ds squared, these all have a double pole um, at zero and no other pole, so they're all linearly dependent on each other. So we should really quotient this out by um, various linear combinations of these. These are usually written in terms of the Jacobi functions s, n, c, n, and d, and as follows. So s, n squared plus c, n squared equals 1, and k squared s, n squared plus d, n squared is also equal to 1. Um, by the way, you notice this looks rather like the formula for sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. In fact, sine and cosine are kind of degenerate cases of Sn and Cn if you allow one of the periods W2 to tend to infinity. Um, this seems to be one of the reasons why Jacobi put the pole in such a funny place. He, he, was, he was trying to make his functions look like sine and cosine. And sine and cosine definitely don't have poles at the origin. So if you want your functions to look like sine and cosine, you'd better put the poles somewhere else. Um, um, we can also use this to give several um, embeddings of elliptic curves. For instance, Weierstrass's um, function we saw maps the curve C over L to a cubic in um, the projective plane. 
Um, similarly, by mapping a point Z to N S Z C S C and D S C, we map the 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 the, the, the latter C over L to a degree four curve in E cubed. And this again shows that Weierstrass is a little bit easier than Jacobi because a, a degree three curve in 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 a two-dimensional plane is a little bit easier to handle than a degree four curve in space. Um, um, I'll just finish with um, some uh, historical remarks about about why why Jacobi chose. Um, such funny conventions. So we can say, why did Jacobi put the poles at omega 2 over 2? Um, well, as I said, um, he had three functions, S, N, C, N, and D, N. And these are actually short for sine of the amplitude, cosine of the amplitude, and derivative of um, the amplitude, where the amplitude was um, a certain function that Jacobi thought was, was really fundamental. Well, you can see what the amplitude is because dn is its derivative. So the amplitude of z is equal to the integral from something to z of um, dn of z dz. Um, the problem is this function is rather a mess. You see, it's not quite periodic. So amplitude of z plus 2 omega 1 is equal to the amplitude of z plus some um, mysterious constant of integration. And similarly, the amplitude of z plus omega 1 plus omega 2 is equal to the amplitude of z plus another constant. So, so the first place, it's not periodic. It's only periodic up to adding a constant. Um, the other problem is it has lots of... Um, logarithmic singularities because dn is poles of order one and when you integrate those you get logarithms um, so so the amplitude is a multi-valued function of logarithmic singularities and branch points everywhere um, it's really quite a mess I, i've got a picture of it here um, so here's a sort of picture of the amplitude value of the amplitude function. These sort of black patches here are, are where the function has a branch point and becomes multi-valued if you go around these points here. And as you can see, the, the function really looks like a bit of a mess. Um, um, so, um, uh, so my, my feeling is that the Amplitude function is probably best forgotten about. It's, it's, it's mainly of interest for historical reasons that it's how Jacobi actually originally came across elliptic functions. Um, you can define it explicitly not using dn. In fact, this is the way Jacobi originally did it. You write z is equal to the integral from 0 to phi of d theta over square root of 1 minus k squared sine squared theta. And then phi is equal to the amplitude of z. So the amplitude was really a bit of a mess. First of all, you've got this rather weird looking integral. And secondly, it's not given by the value of this integral. It's given by the inverse of, the, of this integral. The amplitude is what you have to integrate up to in order to get the number z. So, so you're dealing with this sort of weird inverse of an integral. Um, I think this, this kind of illustrates the well-known saying that pioneering work is really clumsy. The first person to do something quite often, you know, get, gets, gets things in a rather, does things in a rather clumsy way because they're, they're doing something the first time and don't know what they don't know what should be going on. And then later on, other people come along and clean up the area. So Weierstrass came along and gave a much cleaner version of um, elliptic functions, but we should still, so, you know, you should, um, give the credit to the person who came first and did things in, the, in, in, in this rather, rather clumsy way. Um, so um, 
um, elliptic functions, Jacobi's elliptic functions, like the Weierstrass functions, have absolutely masses of identities. Um, I'll just show you very quickly, show you a few of them. Um, uh, again, Wishman and Watson has absolutely pages and pages of these. You see, there are all these identities. There are so many identities that they, they, they write S1 instead of Sn of, of um, Z and it just goes on for pages and pages. Um, I don't see any point in going through um, any of these identities. You, you get things like addition formulas, which are rather similar to the addition formula for the Weierstrass function and so on. Um, but all of these identities, um, or most of them, can be proved in a sort of mechanical way just by um, checking where the poles of both sides of the identity are, because if two elliptic functions have the same poles, they must be the same up to a constant. Um, Jacobi didn't seem to have this technique. Um, I mean, one of Jacobi's problems is that he was developing elliptic functions before complex analysis had really been developed, so he simply didn't have things like Liouville's theorem. Um, and instead of giving these very simple proofs of identities just by checking the poles. He, he gave rather complicated proofs by sort of explicitly calculating both sides and showing they were the same. Um, so to summarise, um, the difference between Weierstrass and Jacobi is um, Weierstrass was looking at um, sections of an order one line bundle. By sections, I mean meromorphic sections, and an order one line bundle is just a fancy way of saying a, a complex valued function. Whereas Jacobi, the Jacobi functions are sections of the three order two line bundles over, this is all over the um, um, elliptic curve C modulo L. Um, so Weierstrass and Jacobi are the cases n equals 1 and n equals 2 of, of looking at line bundles of order n. As I mentioned earlier, you don't have to stop at n equals 2. If you um, really want to, you can do sections of the 9 or, or 8 order 3 line bundles and while away many happy hours um, writing down masses of identities between them, but I really don't see the point. Um, OK, next lecture will probably be about theta functions of lattices.